Welcome, everybody. I could not be more excited to introduce our keynote speaker today. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner. I have the privilege of being dean at the SJ Quinney College of Law. My pronouns are she and hers. And I do want to welcome you to our keynote presentation for the Lee Teitelbaum Law Review Symposium. And I do want to acknowledge that I believe uh, Dean and President Teitelbaum's widow, widow Herta Teitelbaum, is joining us today. So a big welcome and thank you to Herta Teitelbaum and to the Teitelbaum family for all of their support for this event. Um, I want to start before I get into telling you about the amazing Dean Conway. Um, I do want to acknowledge knowledge that this land that I'm presently on, which is in the Salt Lake Valley, um, is named for the Ute tribe and is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. We here at the University of Utah recognize and respect the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activity. Um, also, I want to take a moment to thank our law review and our law review staff for hosting this incredibly important discussion. They've done just a great job, and I have really enjoyed listening to the panelists on the last two panels, and I can assure you that our keynote speaker is going to add even more fabulousness to this conversation. So a big thank you to the Utah Law Review and for our amazing um, student staff for supporting today's symposium. So it's really my pleasure um, to introduce a woman who has been both a mentor and a friend to me. Um, I have learned so much from her, and I'm sure I'm going to continue that trend and learn even more today. She's really a leader among leaders. She's a leader among deans and law schools across the country. And I think she has the best Zoom background. She always has something thought provoking on her table and educational. So I'm sure if you look at the back, yes, look at that. There's something there for that we can all learn from. So her name is Dean Danielle Conway. She is Dean and the Donald J. Farage Professor of Law at the Penn State Dickinson Law. She is a leading expert in procurement law, entrepreneurship, intellectual property, and licensing intellectual property. She joined Dickinson Law after serving for four years as Dean of the University of Maine School of Law and 14 years on the faculty at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, the William H. Richardson School of Law, where she was the inaugural Michael J. Marks Distinguished Professor of Business Law. Prior to her deanships, Dean Conway was a member of the faculties at the Georgetown University Law Center and the University of Memphis Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law. She's also served as a Fulbright Senior Scholar in Australia and later as Chair in Law at the La Trobe University Faculty of Law and Management in Australia. Dean Conway is the author or editor of six books and case books, as well as numerous book chapters, articles, and essays. And I also happen to know that she is working on a book series right now, which is only going to further help us in this space and educate us. So I'm very excited about that. Her scholarly agenda and speeches have focused on, among other areas, advocating for public education and for actualizing the rights of marginalized groups, including indigenous peoples, minoritized peoples, and members of rural communities. Her most recent publication focuses on different aspects of building an anti-racist law school, legal academy, and the legal profession through leadership, vision, priorities, and transformational diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused admissions and faculty and staff recruitment and attend, uh, retention. That is why she is our keynote speaker. Literally everything that is happening in the law school space, she has played a hand in. And as evidence of that, she was the co-recipient of the inaugural Association of American Law Schools AALS Impact Award, which honors individuals who have had significant positive impact on legal education or the legal uh, profession. 
She also received this recognition in acknowledgement for her work establishing the Law Dean's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project, which was launched in 2020. Again, I could go on and on. Her resume is impressive. She knows everything. We learned so much from her. We're so thankful for her. Um, so with that, the fabulous, the amazing Dean Conway. So, wow, all I can say is thank you for that. So I call this uh, presentation Anti-Racism in Legal Education Toward a Thick Vision of Systemic Equity. And I use that term thick because I'm drawing on this context this context of collectivism, of coalition building, and connecting movements. I am thrilled that uh, Mrs. Teitelbaum is with us. I read about Dean Lee Teitelbaum on the webpage, and he is a remarkable man. And I know his mana is with us, along with those of the indigenous peoples whose land we are stewarding. If you can move to the next slide. I wanna underscore and affirm and acknowledge the original owners and stewards of this land. The University of Utah has made an explicit statement about its relationship with the indigenous peoples in the Salt Lake Valley. It is critical that we bless these proceedings which are convened here on that land to honor those people who came before us and to ensure that we teach, learn, listen with open hearts and open minds so that we can progress forward. Next slide. Here is the roadmap that I am going to follow today. I first want to give thanks to everyone who has made this possible. Then I'm going to focus our discussion. It was very uh, thoughtful of Dr. Rosante to mention Paulo Freire and the need to focus discussions because that helps us center, not ourselves, but center the topics that we are discussing. I'll then move forward to decoupling the terms diversity and anti-racism. I'm thrilled that we had this conversation on the two panels, and I hope that what I present in that decoupling gives you a sense of where I am coming from and why I am focusing efforts on anti-racism in particular. I'll then move to a discussion of anti-racism as a constitutive element of systemic equity. And then I hope it will be entertaining and thought provoking to see the videos of the anti-racist teaching and learning that is occurring at Penn State Dickinson Law, where we are taking an affirmative responsibility to engage deeply with our history, the context, of our defining documents and the impact that that has on us today. I'll introduce you to the Race and the Equal Protection of the Laws program and provide you a student assessment that was also videotaped. Finally, I'll end the discussion talking about a massive project. Many of the discussants on the prior panel seem to circle around the question of how. How do we do this? Okay, you're telling me this is the landscape, but how do we do this? I do not offer this building an anti-racist law school, legal academy, and legal profession as the answer. I offer it as a blueprint or a template to ideate how we can problem solve most effectively in our distinct places and spaces. I'll then leave time for question and answer. So let's begin. Next slide. 
So what you see there is my calling on the mana of the ancestors and the elders to provide an authentic, a truthful, a presentation chock full of veracity. That's a picture of my time in Australia with Aboriginal and Tory Strait Islander women along with Angela Y. Davis. My first time ever meeting her was not in the US, but in Australia talking about comparative systemic equity. Second, I want to thank the University of Utah for recognizing the importance of a law school in problem solving with society's greatest issues. Having the S.J. Quinney College of Law as a vibrant partner means that we will achieve progressive solutions to our most intractable problems. Third, I would like to thank my dear friend, Dean Elizabeth Cronk Warner, for taking on a leadership role as an indigenous woman. This is perilous territory, but it takes a special person to face the peril. Why? For the benefit of the community. And I think it is impressive that we honor deans in our genealogy, like Dean Teitelbaum, who believed strenuously in equality. And finally, I want to thank the editors of the Utah Law Review. They are professional, proficient, and they are phenomenal editors who are going to make amazing practitioners. Next slide. So to focus the discussion, it can't be ignored why we are here at this moment. We are here at this moment because of the cascade of crises that we all experienced in 2020. Some of us have been experiencing this trauma for decades. Some of us have written about this trauma linking our historical ancestors to our present context. But that said, the world watched in the first half of 2020 how Black lives were being decimated either by vigilantism or state sanctioned actors. We should focus our energy on never forgetting these names and others so that our work continues to have meaning. The other things that we dealt with and remain vigilant against are the pandemic and voter suppression. The election cycle of 2020 was catastrophic to our democracy. Calls for illegitimacy that were false, has created a sense that our nation, our democracy is not legitimate. Those who are voting officials, who are working under intense pressures with very little funding, many of whom volunteer to do this work, are being assaulted. This is absolutely unacceptable but I say it so that we focus our discussion, particularly in relation to what our special duty is as lawyers, as law students, as law professors, as administrative staff, as administrators, the entire legal education, legal academy, and legal profession have a special duty to uphold the principles that we as 
prior to in our constitutional language. And I think most of you understand what I say when I mean aspirational. And what are we required to do, particularly as we look at issues of systemic oppression, in particular, systemic racial inequality? We cannot look at it individually because individually, we do not create the structures to respond to systemic inequity. We must acknowledge, analyze, address, act, and be accountable for being responsive in contesting systemic racial inequality. And how do we do this? This is the big question, the how. The how is to transform an organization from one built on and operating under systemic racial inequity to one moving toward systemic equity. This movement requires true understanding of racism and the legal architecture that supports it. We have to recognize the disproportionate impact that racist policies, practices, and processes have had on people occupying multiple and intersecting social positionalities generally, and yes, people of color specifically. And why do we focus on that? Why am I focusing on that? It's because racial inequality is a prominent, pervasive feature scaffolding American education generally and American legal education and our system of laws in particular. Next slide. Anti racism and diversity are two different concepts. They can overlap, they can have outcomes that are essential to equality, but they are distinct. We have to understand what we mean when we are talking about diversity versus anti-racism. I am going to go through a couple of statements, and I hope that you are taking notes because I'd love for us to have a Q&A about this. I see these terms actually conflating and that in that conflation, impeding us as we attempt to address structural and institutional inequity. As you see from the slides, I talk about diversity being a broad concept, valuing people equally. And then you see in italics using this word, regardless of their differences. The panels have talked about, Professor Romero talked about color blind versus color conscious. This is one impediment of diversity because it plants a flag too late in the process to address structural inequality. Mm -hmm. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are broader concepts though that can encompass anti-racism, but we should know what anti-racism is so that we avoid the impediment that comes with such conflation. As well, diversity, equity, and inclusion references demo demographic variation and attempts to foster a culture and a climate that draws on benefits that flow from assembling people. We heard about this from Angela Winfield. People have various identities and lived experiences that actually can be profitable and useful when properly directed. 
But when they're happening within a structure that is permeated by systemic inequity, the outcomes are not going to exist to defeat it. DEI can exist along many points on a spectrum. And I really want to touch on this difference between performative diversity and active diversity. I also want to actually cite a law professor who has done some really amazing work articulating this in an accessible way. And I intentionally cite her, not because she is at the top of the field, that she is in the field. And her name is Professor Renee Nicole Allen, and she's written a wonderful essay that is accessible that you can find in the Rutgers Law Review article. And here's what she says about diversity alone. It's not a remedy for systemic racial inequity. She identifies that a focus on diversity shrouds flaws of a system that is oppressive and inequitable. That diversity ideology posits that exclusion is the problem as opposed to systems of oppression. She goes on to state that diversity frames racial representation as a remedy while protecting the status quo of structural and institutional advantages that privilege whiteness. I want to take a lead off of what Professor Renee Nicole Allen has identified and gives you a personal experience that might help to provide praxis for this critique. As Dean Kroc Warner identified, I lived and worked in Hawaii for 15 years. Hawaii, yes, by definition, is multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural. It is a landscape that is the epitome of diverse constituencies. The state actually prides itself on not having any one racial, ethnic, or cultural group being in the majority. But in many ways, my 15 years of experience there taught me that this pride was misplaced because there exists pervasive social stratification within that community. I point this out not because I want to criticize Hawaii. Instead, I use it as a concrete example that demonstrates that diversity by itself is not enough to achieve systemic equity, let alone fix systemic equity. There's another caveat to that story as well. I have colleagues who worked for many years at the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. And against the backdrop of what I described, that office was very busy. But part of their workload was taking in cases by white people who felt in this place and space that they were being discriminated against. And we had many discussions about these various cases and why many of these individuals felt as though they were being discriminated against. And for the most part, many of the cases were dismissed. And in one of these discussions, it hit me what was happening. Why were white people in Hawaii filing complaints to the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission? It was because they were not experiencing discrimination. Instead, they were experiencing the absence of privilege that they had become so conditioned to expect. Now, moving over to anti-racism. 
It requires a true and faithful understanding of American structural racism, that legal architecture, and the disproportionate impact on people of color and people with intersecting positionalities. Anti-racism as a practice activates institutional, structural, and systemic change within organizations and is laser focused on the acknowledging, the analyzing, the addressing, the acting, and the accountability. Two, not add people, not add people, but to contest racism embedded in policies, practices, and processes of that organization. I'm going to call this institutional anti-racism. So I hope with this discussion, you begin to understand why these two concepts are just juxtaposed in this way. You can envision that in DEI, we could have inputs, inputs being hiring, but not have the policies, practices, or processes that support those individuals who have been hired. Thus, when we turn to anti-racism, you see that the action, and I'm defining action as the will and the capacity to do this kind of systemic equity work that is thick. I want to proclaim here that anti-racism is not a panacea, it's not the catch-all. It is not all-encompassing. Instead, I view it as a constitutive element for beginning on a path of seeking and performing acts of systemic equity. As well, anti-racism allows for fewer off-ramps to contest structural and institutional racism. We heard a panel talk about the infraction hiring process of a particular candidate and the questions that they were asking that candidate. These are the kinds of off-ramps that are allowable when we are not using concrete terms such as anti-racism and as Dr. Rosante talked about, building the muscle memory of contesting racism. Next slide, please. Again, to ensure that we all understand that anti-racism is being discussed here by me as a constitutive element I want to display for you systems of inequality. We can look at classism, racism, settler colonialism, ableism, heterosexism, cisgenderism, sexism, and more. What I am proposing with the remainder of this conversation is that by looking at anti-racism as a constitutive element, building a blueprint or a prototype, we can create a response to one of the just entrenched and embedded elements of American society, and then use that knowledge, use those problem solving techniques and ideas to broaden the sphere, the sphere of systemic equity, to reach all of these intersecting positionalities. So next slide. One of the reasons why I am certain I was invited to come here to speak today about reimagining, rethinking legal education 
is because that is exactly what we are doing at Penn State Dickinson Law. It's not important who's first, it's important that we do it. And having this conversation helps spread the word of the how. How are we gonna transform our institutions? So what you see there is the first faculty resolution passed by the faculty unanimously to pledge action against anti-Blackness. The second resolution that you see is to act, to act, to teach and learn. Now I'm gonna set this up for you because many questions were asked in the Q&A. Well, how do you do this? Or how do you do that? Or who do you include? Or, or what are you going to, what's the first place to start? What can we do? I wanna give you some data points first. I've been here for two years. Penn State Dickinson Law has moved its student of color population from 21% to 40%. As well, in those two years, we've moved our faculty population from 12% faculty of color to 30%. As Dr. Boylorn talked about, administrators do have leverage, but I want to tweak something that she said. Administrators, certain administrators have proximity to power and not power in fact. Proximity to power, if you think about it, we talked about the Black women law deans. We talked about the women of color law deans. We've talked about Black men deans. We talked about men of color. There are LGBTQ deans. I do not know whether anyone has expressly identified as transgender. I do not know. But these deans in their roles have proximity to power. And I can say that after having two deanships, that I do not have power. But what I do have is the ability to build relationships, to build coalitions, and to create an embrace around people who believe in the fundamental principle of equality. To the point of what we've been able to do at Penn State Dickinson Law, the next data point I give you is that we have never had a faculty colleague in these two years who teaches critical race theory. We don't have a full-time faculty member who has done that. And I point that out to refer back to what Professor Allen talked about and sort of cabining in diversity to rest with one person. It was serendipitous that we did not have a faculty colleague who taught critical race theory or who taught race racism in the law. Why? Because by definition, then it couldn't fall on one person. So what we built in being responsive to the promise that we made to act, to teach and learn according to anti-racist principles is that every faculty member, every staff member, Every administrator was asked to participate in developing the materials for the course that we call Race and Equal Protection of the Laws. We unanimously passed that it be a required course. And so our faculty and our staff 
We're not complaining. Oh, but I already carry four courses. They created content for this course and it's delivered on a modular basis, meaning we deliver eight classes throughout the year. So what I have for you now and what Charlie is going to uh, put together, he's going to set up one of the courses that a faculty member had prepared for part of the race and equal protection of the law course. I'll talk to you a little bit about the true history of capitalism in the United States and its, its close ties uh, to slavery. Uh, next slide, please. Let me start to you with a really boring slide that nobody's gonna understand, and that's by design. This is called a collateralized debt obligation. All you need to know is two things. One, it's a bunch of loans tied up in a bundle. You slice it up, you sell people that as an investment. And two, it's the primary reason that we had the 2008 financial crisis. If you've seen the movie, The Big Short, uh, if you've read the book, The Big Short, you'll know more about this. This is a way to squeeze more money out of other money. Let's take a mortgage, which is already a financial instrument, package it up, and then sell a whole bundle of mortgages. We make so much more money. And a lot of people got rich off of this. And a lot of people got hurt from this in 2008. I want you to understand in the next five minutes how the 2008 financial crisis and the concept of a CDO, a collateralized debt obligation, started with American slavery. Next slide, please. What you see here is something that was quite common during the slave era of the United States, a mortgage, but more specifically, a slave mortgage. Uh, it, you know, as much as slavery obviously is a tragedy of a loss of human spirit, human independence, you know, the idea of being ripped away from one's homeland and just the, the general nature of the imposition on free will, slaves in the U.S. weren't just people. They were assets. They were financial assets. And in fact, the use of slaves as collateral, as secured interest in financial transactions was quite common. And most bankers at the time, and this is well documented in the history, actually preferred slaves as collateral assets for mortgages. Now think about this for a moment. At this time in the United States, land was plentiful. Land was not scarce. So land was not that great a security. Pledging your land, which is what you would do now for a typical mortgage or land in the house, didn't mean much to a bank. They didn't want your land. They can go find 100 miles due west. They also didn't want your crops. Crops come and go, good season, bad season crops, not a great security, but slaves, slaves were viewed as prime assets because they were known commodities of labor. And in the same way, in fact, that Wall Street used to chop up some good mortgages, some bad mortgages, some decent mortgages, put them together into a CDO and sell them during the 2008 financial crisis, slave owners used to bundle slaves into asset pools, older, younger, prime aged, as the term was at the time, slaves. They would create an asset pool of slaves and offer them to banks as collateral. Now think here for a moment, that asset pool I just described to you, which is really a pool of human beings, was not even defined by family. They didn't care whose family the slaves belonged to, that they were splitting up a family. Most slave owners, when they were pledging these assets to banks, wanted to get the most money out of them, and therefore they would focus on pledging their most productive slaves at the time. Next slide, please. Now, the use of slaves as assets didn't stop there. And this is where we start getting into, you know, some of the roots of modern financial speculation. Southern farmers were under a lot of pressure to constantly increase their production, which they needed more slaves to do, but they only had so much cash. And so what they started to do was issue slave bonds. What does that mean? A, a Southern plantation owner could take the 100 slaves they already had, go to the bank, mortgage them, get half the capital back, buy a whole bunch more slaves, mortgage them, get more cash back, buy more slaves, and on and on and on. And what we started to see in the South was tremendous amount of debt piling up on the backs of plantation owners because they were constantly mortgaging and buying new slaves to drive more and more production. And these bonds became incredibly important assets in the early American history. They were very, very popular. In fact, these packaged slave bonds, and that's what they were called, slave bonds, were used not only to fund plantation growth, they were used to fund early American railroads. They were used to fund the original establishment of the company DuPont. And here's the greatest irony and tragedy of all. Northern Americans who had already 
switched over to a, you know, a non-slave owning mentality, already abolished slavery in some parts, would buy these bonds as secured assets. They're considered good, reliable returns. Europeans, the Dutch, the French, the Germans were buying slave bonds as reliable assets, despite the fact that slavery had been outlawed. Because at the end of the day, an asset, no matter how dirty the morality within it may be, if it has a good return, if it has a good interest rate, that's good business. And we all know that that logic persists today in Wall Street and sometimes is one of the greatest criticisms of modern Wall Street, that there's very little morality in finance. There's very little questions about, well, should we be doing this? The definition of success even today in Wall Street is, am I making money? And people were making money not just off slave labor, but off of slave speculation in the form of slave bonds. Next slide, please. Now, here's where it starts to get eerily reminiscent of our recent history. Slave bonds became very popular. Banks started issuing slave bonds. In fact, many of the banks that you still know today, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, were some of the original issuers of slave bonds. This asset class became so popular that there was banks asking slave plantation owners to buy more slaves so they could issue more bonds. The demand for slaves was artificially increased due to their excellent participation as an asset in the financial market. They were making money left and right. The price of slaves started to go up. The demand for slaves, you know, basic demand, uh, you know, economy started to go up and the bond prices started to go up. You started to have a bubble, an asset bubble, which eventually burst after the Civil War with the total abolition of slavery and the inability to import any more slaves and eventually the total outlawing of slavery altogether. Oops, sorry. So the Supreme Court is actually faced with a very important question here. What do we do with all these slave bonds after the Civil War? Do we excuse them? We deem them to be illegal on the basis of them, you know, contributing law, contributing morality, whatever it may be. Well, listen to the answer here. It may remind you of some of the concerns about the outcomes of the 2008 financial crisis. The Supreme Court decided that despite a war being fought, despite tremendous legislation and you know, a re-engineering of our American law to finally formally outlaw slavery, maybe not in practice, but at least in law, that these bonds were still legal. They were still valid obligations. And they required the plantation owners, the railroads, all these other entities that had issued slave bonds to still pay back those loans. So the banks that had driven the speculation in slavery, much the same way that they'd driven the speculation in mortgages in 2008, paid virtually no penalty whatsoever for that speculation. They were still able to demand payment from those slave owners, much in the same way the many of the banks that had traded mortgages in the 2008 financial crisis were still able to foreclose on the homes of those mortgage holders. And as we know, disproportionately in minority populations. The real lesson you have here today is that when you have something as terrible as slavery in history, don't just look at that single evil, look at the evils that it propagates. And what we have here is a lesson in capitalism is that slavery as a tragedy also drove a tragedy of finance, drove an unhealthy speculation in the market, which unfortunately, this process, this bubble, this form of asset securitization is still in use today and still has consequences in our modern capitalism. Thank you. Picture this. We have a two hour class, 5.30 to 7.30. And from 5.30 to about 6.15, we have second year students, third year students, faculty members, staff members doing these five minute presentations. Professor Badisi's was a little bit longer, but we'll give him grace. But these five minute presentations to our first year students. And the first year students are not just hearing from faculty, they're hearing from staff, they're hearing from their own colleagues. And the student colleagues are also doing the research for their presentations during these eight modules. And these modules touch on capitalism, democracy, housing, uh, healthcare, any number of issues. And we circulate these issues so that the expertise in that area, our faculty can contribute to the race and equal protection of the law class. But what does this mean? 
This means that there is both teaching and learning on behalf of the faculty member. And we have significant discussions about this. And, you know, we were talking about that boomerang effect with Dr. Boylorn. And she was saying, you know, we can't have people just reverting back to the status quo. And that's true. And that's why you have to have consistent community building exercises and promoting people to say, you can do this. And here, let me give you some examples that will help your presentation. Because at the end of the day, many people are looking at this as something they have no experience with. But my contention is we are all really well-educated people and we know how to do research. And when we do that research, we can convey that information in a way that connects the dots to what we are studying during that day. We then have breakout sessions so that small groups can discuss the materials that they heard, for example, in this case, in the capitalism section. And we give them a prompt and we ask them to come prepared with something written to that prompt. And that prompt could be as simple as, how should the law have been written? How can we disrupt this inequity? What is your impression of the context in which this slave bond occurred? So that people can get comfortable with the conversation about how our law is part and parcel of the architecture of systemic equity. And it can be equally part and parcel of the law of systemic equity. So accountability is important. And so we have student reactions and all the reactions are not great. Let me tell you, the first year was rocky, but that's okay, that's to be expected. But one of, well, we had a, many of the students and you can actually go to the website and see many of the comments, but I pulled this particular commentary from one of the student assessments because assessment is critical. So Charlie, if you could play the second video. For me, the biggest benefit of the course is that it supplements the content of the other classes. It actually helps you understand the material in your other classes. For example, in one of our sessions, we focused on the issue of housing in the Jim Crow era. We looked at restrictive covenants based on race or color and discussed it in the context of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. About a week after that session in my constitutional law class, we discussed the scope and limits of Congress's power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. I was immediately reminded of our, of our conversation uh, in race and equal protection. Thank you. And so what you see there, and we do exit surveys so that we can improve the course for the following year. So that is an introduction to the anti-racist teaching and learning as an affirmative responsibility at Penn State Dickinson Law. Now I want to go to the next slide. And with my final uh, few minutes here in the main conversation, I want to introduce you to that massive project I told you about. So I have been working for the past year on a proposal called Building an Anti-Racist Law School Legal Academy and Legal Profession. It is huge and it is meant to cover exactly what it says it will cover. The idea, as I mentioned when I started off, was to give people a head start on the how. The head start emanated from three law review articles that my colleagues and I published with the Rutgers Race and Law Review, talking about how we actually did what we did with the race and equal protection of the law class. You'll see that the first article singles out anti-racism in admissions. 
The second article talks about developing law school curriculum with a view to the administrator's role. And I remember someone asked a, cl- a question about how can administrators do this? And you know, there's a link right there and that's exactly how to do it. And then the final article is educating anti-racist lawyers and the praxis that we developed to create the race and equal protection of the law cl- class. I again commend to you that none of these authors, including myself, are experts in race, racism in the law, critical race theory. What we are, are faculty who made a promise to act and we are delivering on that promise. And so from these three articles, I was approached by University of California Press, next slide, to actually consider not writing a book about building an anti-racist law school, but writing a eight to 10 volume series. And I accepted the challenge, as you could see on the left side of the screen, to senior edit this work, but I'm only doing it because it's a launch pad to something that we desperately need in law schools, the legal academy, and the legal profession. We need an anti-racist development institute where our leadership teams can come together. They can ideate. They can prototype. They can take risks. They can think about problem solving within every function of the law school enterprise. So on the right, and while it may be very small for you to see, I have used my expertise in government contracts and systems design to think about the various functions of an organization starting with leadership, moving to pipeline programs, talking about curriculum development, teaching and learning, talking about academic success, talking about the bar examination and other licensure pathways, talking about career services and employment like we talked about today with attorney Donnelly, and lastly, talking about anti-racism in philanthropy. So by taking this systems design approach, looking at every function of the organization and saying, based on the place and space, based on the context of this institution, this anti-racist development institute will help your leadership teams ideate about implementable responses to the structures and the systems that perpetuate inequity. And this is not a one and done. This is about building that muscle memory, meaning part of the engagement in the Anti-Racist Development Institute will be to have mid-implementation assessments, reporting back, presentations by the leadership teams, and critique. And that critique is not just by other people in the field. That critique is gonna be by the very students, the very staff, the very faculty who have to work within that organization. When you look at the names under the various functions, these are placeholders. People who have said, I'm so excited about that project, I'm gonna contribute a chapter to that book series. But this is what I am putting forth today. Everyone is invited to be a part of this. Whether you contribute a chapter, whether you review a chapter, whether you write a critique, whether you join a conference and serve as one of the panel of critiquers, everyone across the legal academy, everyone across law schools will be invited to participate in this experience. This is our time now. We need to take this time and do what our affirmative responsibility commands us to do. Be the lawyers that actually meet the expectation of the aspirations of that document 
we call the Constitution and the thick understanding of the 14th Amendment. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I've had a really fun time with this presentation and I look forward to your questions. Well, and we've had a wonderful time learning from you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so now we have uh, 20 minutes or so uh, for questions and answers. Again, by way of reminder, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A. Please feel free to um, drop a question for Dean Conway into the Q&A. Um, so our first question comes from Nicole. Nicole says, this speaker is incredible. I absolutely agree. Um, my question is, how can law school administrations decouple diversity encouragement and anti-racism racism work, doing them both but keeping them separate? Oh, I think you're muted, Dean Conway. All right, thanks, sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> so students have, uh, sorry, students have responded well to the incremental education around diversity and anti-racism. And it's just like synthesis in any area of the law, right? Sometimes you have to break things down into it, its constituent parts before you understand how those things come back together. And so we are not, number one, and, and we're practicing what we're preaching here, so we're not grading this course, right? We're giving students an opportunity to practice with this. And we're using the workshops and the discussions to help them learn how to begin to synthesize or overlay DEI on top of anti-racism. Because it is, DEI is a larger umbrella. But I, I love this uh, comment that Dr. Boylorn said, and I wanted to, to quote that uh, in answer to this question. She said, diversity is an umbrella term that is used for everything. So it sometimes means nothing. And so we need to think about the disaggregation of these two terms so that we don't have that opportunity for these things to become just, just not conceivable, not, not describable or understandable. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alyssa, um, who asks, how have the programs implemented at Penn State impacted how students practice law with the principles of anti-racism teaching and learning beyond the classroom? So I think Eric Min Lee is a great example uh, to show how students have been impacted in the classroom. They're able to make more quick connections between the text of the constitution or the text of statutes and applying them in their other courses like constitutional law too, or family law or uh, legislation and regulation, but in particular, our live client clinics. And so this has been an opportunity for students to, to gain that level of relationship with the clients whom they are serving so that they have a better understanding of those clients and the burdens that those clients disproportionately bear. One of the things that Eric Min Lee talked about was being able to contextualize for himself what it means uh, in the context of housing or what it means in the context of, of the 14th Amendment. And you know what? I, I dare anybody to, to sort of talk about the five provisions of the 14th Amendment and, for example, understand, you know, the Native American taxation, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and whether they were citizens if they weren't taxed. Well, the the beauty of it is that our students know that. And that's phenomenal because I will tell you, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know that when I was a law student, much to the same respect as uh, Attorney Donnelly said. You know, what, what we learned in constitutional law was the Equal Protection Clause 
and those classifications. There's a great article out well, a long, long time ago um, by Balkin and Reva Siegel. And it, it, it talks about the American civil rights tradition, anti-classification or anti-subordination. Mm. And what they're really getting at, right, is these classifications that we've all learned, which are based on colorblind jurisprudence. Mm-hmm. Not the real thick understanding of the 14th Amendment that is, you know, a thick, con- a thick context and understanding the history and, and what motivated each one of those provisions. Mm-hmm. Yep. So very true. Um, so I was listening to you and I didn't look at the questions. OK, uh, <laughs> next question comes from Maxwell who says, how can individual students engage with their course material in a more intersectional way? And I'll add on to this, you know, I think the point that uh, one of our earlier panelists made that it shouldn't be all the responsibility of the students, right? Um, I think as administrators and faculty and lawyers in the profession, we we owe a duty as well, as you pointed out. Um, So I would just add on to that question of, of any suggestions for, I know we've got a couple of law professors professors on the call of what we can do um, to have more of an intersectional dialogue. Yeah, I really like this quote that I read before, and let me take my distance glasses off. (laughs) (laughs) We all occupy multiple and intersecting social positionalities. So when we were talking about self-awareness and then awareness of others, and we were talking about Um, really understanding who we are, it would be amazing to do positionality exercises to accept the truth of some of our, our challenges. So Angela Winfield is blind, right? Um, we were referencing lawyers who won't report that they have mental health challenges, right? So some of that, whether you say it out loud to someone or whether you explicitly reference it while you are alone in a room is is connecting with your positionality. And if you can connect with your positionality, then you actually have an opportunity to decenter yourself. So it's, it, then it's not about you at the center of this. But if I have this positionality, let me look and see if someone else has this. And then let me see what identity is intersecting with them to create, for example, gendered racism and ableism, right? And so, you know, Angela offers us a one, Angela Winfield offers us a wonderful opportunity to look at that. Yeah, I agree. This is something I've been reflecting on um, in my positionality as a light skinned person or person who presents lighter skin. I, um, as you know, have been really open about, um, about my mental health challenges and the fact that I have PTSD and anxiety and two thoughts on that. First, it's really frustrating to me how many people are like, oh, you're so brave to talk about that. Cause I'm like, no, we need to talk about this. Like this shouldn't be bravery. This should just be like, I'm having a rough day. Cause I didn't sleep last night. Cause my anxiety is off the charts. But then I was at a conference and it might've been something that you and I were at. And I was talking about that. And somebody said, you know, in the comments, oh, you're so brave. But I thought, no, actually it's that intersection identity Because we've talked about how um, when you you've talked about or others have talked about being a a black female dean, Mm -hmm. there's like this perception of having to be excellent all the time and just go above and beyond. And so on some level, the fact that I can talk about my mental health challenges, I think it's easier because of my identity as a lighter skinned individual, whereas people who have darker skin Um, have to constantly kind of achieve even more. And so it was interesting after that, I can't remember exactly when it was, it was recently, but I walked away from it, just really reflecting on that, how my positionality as yes, I'm a diverse person, but I'm a light skin diverse person. And it maybe makes it a little Mm -hmm. bit easier for me to talk about mental health 
and how these things um, intersect with one another. So I absolutely agree, like kind of constantly reflecting on that. It's really an iterative process um, uh, is really helpful. And I know it's something I'm constantly working on. <laughs> always- yeah. And, and, what, and one of the things that I was really thinking hard about when I was preparing this for your community, which was so fantastic. Thank you for inviting me again. Uh, oh, but, we're honored to have you. <laughs> but the thing I kept going back to was my time in Australia. So I spent a total of two years there. And, you know, a lot of times and I was listening to Attorney Donnelly, and you're like, you know, I can't, he was saying, I can't, you know, put myself in a position of, of a black woman who is feeling this. And I'm like, if you go somewhere else, if you go outside of your comfort zone and you spend some time, guess what? You're going to understand. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to feel it. Right. Because, yes. because, you know, when you're in the Northern territory and, you know, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are your community members, you're going to feel other. Mm-hmm. You know, when we think about language, right, and you don't understand French or you don't understand Spanish, channel that feeling mm-hmm. and then think about, ooh, this, is, this might be how a Black woman feels when she walks into the boardroom. Yes. <laughs> and, so, and so I am so, um, I, I'll go there in a minute to tell people that because I don't believe it's that hard. hmm well, and two also, so two thoughts on that. Amen. Absolutely. And, and somebody else mentioned it earlier, um, uh, making these very same points, you know, I really appreciate it coming through, but I, my husband and I, my husband is a white heterosexual man. So part of the dominant society, he and I were co-teaching a class at the Haskell Indian nations university, which is a tribal serving college. And we had um, a student in our class who refused to listen to him because he Mm -hmm. was not native and just did not want to listen to him. And it was so frustrating to him. You know, he's like, just because I'm a man and I'm white, like my voice can't be heard. And I'm like, on the one hand, I'm very sorry you're having that experience. But on the other hand, I'm kind of glad you are because now you've had that experience And now you can sympathize instead of emphasizing, at least you have something to come back to um, because otherwise it's really hard to have those experiences. But I am, I am, we, you and I could chat for a while and and I don't want to take all the time. Um, We do have a question from professor Leslie Culver and big shout out to professor Leslie Culver. Um, It was mentioned earlier that there was a group of faculty who helped with this conference, which is true, but Leslie Culver really took the laboring oar. So I just want to give a shout out to um, professor Culver. And um, she says in her, or her question, um, I'm curious what a first step would be toward creative and inclusive uh, curriculum. And I will let you know, Dean Conway, our faculty curriculum committee is actually working on this question right now. So your, 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 your wisdom is very well timed in terms of what should we do? Should we do something? Um, so what are your thoughts on a first step? So I think a first step, and I know this sounds like I'm touting Penn State Dickinson Law, but please go to the website and actually look at, um, we have several videos there um, because it really walks you through the process that we use to create the class. It really is a by the numbers. You know how you paint by the numbers? It literally is that. So that's the first thing that you do. But I think the second thing that you do, we had the emergency of the pandemic of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery pushing us. We had our students who were pushing us, you know. So we had a built-in sort of speed demon working on us. I would actually, the first, the second thing I would do is not wait, right? We as lawyers, we try to do everything perfectly. We are our own worst enemies. And that's why systems design is so intuitive and so important for this process, because it's saying you're going to fail. Right. Read my lips. You're going to fail. And then what do you do after you fail? You get back up and you try it again or you try something else. So don't let time be your worst enemy. Act like, I love it, you gave me a chance to to cite Hamilton, act like you're running out of time. (laughs) That's how I would answer it. 
I love it. Well, and thank you for that advice. And we have given the faculty curriculum committee um, the Penn State Dickinson website to take a look at. So we will take advantage of that. So thank you so much for putting it out there. Um, this next question actually leads nicely into a question I was going to ask you um, if we if we hadn't gotten other questions. I know you've been a leader in the critical race theory space in terms of I know you played a really big role in some of the statements that have recently been released and that uh, we've used here in our discussions. And so this professor come or this question comes from Professor Erica George. Mm -hmm. It says, could you speak to strategies of managing microaggressions and backlash when introducing anti-racist ideas or CRT to an audience that is not receptive or is resistant to receiving new information that con contradicts received wisdom? Thanks for a fabulous presentation. So y'all should know Professor Erica George is amazing. Okay, so now that I got that out. Um, I think... This is what it means to be old. You know, you cross over that line where you just don't care what people think. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. You're not gonna, okay, you're not gonna listen to me. I got you, I got you. But I think this is the place where, and again, I go back to attorney Donnelly. You could have somebody who's right there next to you saying, hold on people, we are gonna do this. Hold on. Let me ask the question then if you don't want to hear the question or the answer from her. And you got to get people up to saying that. Um, it, it, it stands to reason why we've had su such success with this. And it was because I was flanked by two white men who wanted to do this work. And that's how those people can be proponents. And then the other thing is channel your old lady, Dean Conway, and go, whatever. Okay, you are not old. <laughs> Mostly just because you're just only a couple years older than me. <laughs> but no, I think there's some real truth in that. We just, at the at SJ Quinney College of Law, we just hired a new assistant dean, um, for student affairs and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And he identifies as white, male, heterosexual. And I gave a pause to that hire, and I've been open with him, um, he knows this, about that identity and what that means for Utah. But I also think there's a broader lesson there that diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism is not just for diverse people. Right. And he is very excited about that mission and articulating it. And so I think that point is really well taken that sometimes non-diverse folks can be tremendous allies and um, help in getting the message across. And so I'm, I'm really excited for him and what he's going to bring to our community. Yeah. You know, can I say one more thing about Eric Minley, the student you heard? And, yeah. and so we did this class before all of the Asian hate mm. that was spewed in our communities. And these amazing students channeled all of their education to respond. They did marches, they did protests, our Asian Pacific Islander student organizations. And so also channel those other affinity groups and other uh, student of color groups because they're gonna be great allies. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I think it's sometimes um, I had a, 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 a situation when I was in law school that I'm really embarrassed of now. In hindsight, when I was in law school, University of Michigan was defending the Grutter v. Bollinger case. Mm -hmm. And I was president of the Native American Law Students Association. And the university asked the, um, the kind of student groups of color to come together to write a brief in support of the university's position, which we did, but we ended up and we got it done and we got it filed and it's fine. But in the process, we fought like cats and dogs. Cause I think we kind of wanted like, oh no, my experience is worse or I've faced more oppression. And it was a really good, it was a failure going to your point of, we, we learn a lot from failures. I've certainly had a lot of failures in my life. Uh, this was a failure. I mean, we did get a brief but it was not, the process was not a healthy process. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just such a good learning lesson of, you no, know, we should be fighting amongst ourselves. We can find great allyship um, with each other and supporting one another. And so I learned that one the hard way through failure. Sure. Uh, our EOC of the law review asks, uh, 
I do have a question for Dean Conway. Are other schools looking to follow the Penn State model? So the answer is they are looking to us for leadership. And I am very intentional when I say every blueprint has to be treated that way. So it's not plug and play. It's not, you know, cut and paste. You have to look at, and you can appreciate this Dean Crump Warner uh, being an indigenous woman. You know, every, every indigenous group is different. Within, right, in the, the, the community. And so your response, just like law schools, your response has to be, complementary to where you are and what it is you are trying to accomplish. Now, I will say this, um, because I didn't make it too clear when I was talking about the building the anti-racist law school, legal academy, and legal profession. All of these chapter contributors for this series are from law schools all across the nation. We have 80 drafters and 30 law schools represented, and we want more. And you'll be seeing something come out with press release come out you'll be seeing uh, a survey come out asking you to participate. But if we are able to coherently work this project across the academy, then we might actually bubble up various blueprints that can actually serve as examples or illustrations for similarly situated law schools, like public law schools, private law schools, small law schools, large law schools, and so forth. Yeah, exact, exactly. And and um, we'll do what we can to help with that. Uh, Utah Law is going to host a, a joining of deans to work on anti-racism. And we were talking about having breakout sessions specific to those very issues. You know, are you a standalone law school? Are you a law school in a quote unquote red state? Are you a law school in a blue state? You know, kind of recognizing that every law school has different challenges based on its positionality. And so that's wonderful. And I really applaud, um, applaud you on that. So we've got a question from Jensen Linquist, who is my fabulous research assistant. He's wonderful. Um, so in a school like Utah that is predominantly white and heterosexual and which receives students primarily from a white and heterosexual community, what are ways for students to develop and gain skills in being allies to underrepresented students? I have a great answer for this. And it draws on my experience at the William S. Richardson School of Law in Hawaii. So every year, at least when I was there, I was never on the admissions committee. Every year that I was at Hawaii, for a cohort of about 80 or 85 students, we always had one Black student. <laughs> so you're like, okay, so we got this Black Law Students Association. What do we do with that? with one student. And so what we devised there was a call for people to join the Black Law Students Association, even if they were white or if they were Chinese or if they were Japanese or if they were Laotian or if they were Cambodian or if they were Filipina or Filipino, Latinx. I mean, everybody, Native Hawaiian, come on, let's just, let's just do it. And what we did was we made sure the programming uh, was instructive. And this might have been how I sort of got early ideas about how to do this kind of work at Penn State Dickinson Law. But we made sure the programming instructed people about the Black experience generally, but even the Black experience in Hawaii, because there, was a, there is a lot of history about Blacks in Hawaii. And so that is one way that you can do that. Go sign up for the student organization. Our, at Penn State Dickinson Law, our outlaw student organization is the largest student organization on campus. It's similar here. Uh, we, uh, students who self-identify as LGBTQ were our largest uh, group coming in in the class of 24. And similarly, uh, in the state of Utah, there are only um, between 200 and 300 every year black um, students who graduate from high school. 
So we have a very small group of uh, black students who are going to university or graduating mm -hmm. from high school. So the pipeline is slim. So we can we can relate to that Hawaii experience. So thank you so much for that. That's really instructional. Um, next, we have a question from Mary who says to build upon this question, you were able to implement dramatic changes in diversity in the two years you have been with Penn State. What advice do you have for student bodies to help implement these changes from within the student body? And I do think that's a helpful question. Um, you sitting in kind of the administrator's chair, a chair, quintessential middle management. What is helpful from the students? Um, and then what is kind of the administration slash faculty slash staff responsibility? I think that's really helpful. Oh yeah, and students are the raison d'etre. And when they come a calling, you better listen. So what students can do is come with an organized platform. This is about, and, and I would use the narrative, look, we are just trying to help you. So <laughs> come with that narrative. We wanna assist administration. Look. Here are five or 10 law schools similarly situated like us. We can do better. Now, what is it that you need us to do? Uh, I, I love when students talk to, um, we call them trusted advisor groups. Mm -hmm. So our alumni, so that the alumni can learn that this is not Dean Conway's issue alone that the students want this too. Therefore, I'm not having to carry that bucket of water as if I were by myself. When our students talk to our trusted advisor groups and our board of advisors, it means so much to me because I just sit back and I can, I can breathe because it's coming from a place of authenticity. It's coming from a place of knowing because this is what students expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. We were we were just talking about that our administration and in, in the context of um, LGBTQ identity and uh, gender presentation and dress, and how we really want to push the boundaries, but it's kind of hard because on some levels it's beyond us because it's the legal profession, and so we're going to just have to do all this educational outreach to the larger legal profession on what is and isn't appropriate um, in terms of gender norming. And so I think that's a great space where students can really help us with that outreach and saying, you know, this isn't just the law school coming up with this, but this is this is the new norm. This is where society's going. And you see how excited I am right now? Because I'm yes, like, that's, I saw you leaning right, forward. I'm like, that, that's gotta be a chapter in the career services volume mm -hmm. of the series, right? Yeah. This is the new expectation. Yes. And, and just so you all know, these chapters are not to, meant to be dense. We want just eight to 10 pages because we want to get to the point. This is not about hiding the ball. I would love 10 pages on that topic. I have two people I can volunteer for you who are working okay. right here. <laughs> You know, it's been an interesting progression because when I started law school, which has been like 25 years ago now, you know, it was very much women should wear heels and pantyhose and, you know, identify in certain ways through their dress. And I don't think that's acceptable anymore, but there are some in our profession who still expect that. So these, these areas of inflection and transition are really important. And I think that's a great example of where students can really help us message that and, and hopefully help us make a change. Yeah, um, I would love to see them show up to move court. Like, hey, this is it. I yes. have a Yeah, right. Well, I have and then win and oh, not yeah. have the judge. Oh, yeah. says, oh you should wear you were one one of my students um had that blue sparkly nail polish on and it, mm -hmm. it, it I mean I was like, yes, because he showed up. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited. You see how excited I am. Yes, I know. Well, those are small. I mean, it's they're they're small, but they they in the aggregate have tremendous impact. Impact, yeah. And I mean, these are just areas where we we can do better. And so yeah. it's really, really helpful. Um, well, unfortunately, I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, any concluding thoughts uh, for us? Well, I want to say this because I was struck. I, I listened to every panel this morning and I am blown away at the questions 
the maturity, the professionalism of the questions, because you know, sometimes we're on these panels and it can get raucous. So congratulations to the SJ Quinney College of Law and Dean Crump Warner, because you've got great people. I agree. We're really fortunate to have a wonderful community. And I feel like you taking the time to educate us and um, uh, make us push us to think a little harder on these issues will hopefully make us that much stronger. And so we are so appreciative of you both for taking the time. I know you're very busy to share your wisdom with us, but also just to thank you for all the great work you're doing, seen and unseen in the legal academy. You're truly, as I mentioned earlier, a leader among leaders. And we are so, so, so fortunate to have you in law. So big thank you to Dean Conway. And uh, I believe that brings us to the end of today's session, but we'll be back tomorrow with another amazing uh, diverse female leader, Nia Dow, who will kick us off tomorrow. And I just got news that she's a new endowed chair at Southwestern Law, so we can we can celebrate her new accomplishments. So please join us tomorrow. And again, a big thank you to everyone for helping to make this first day so great. Che McWitch, thank you. Thank you.